Awesome. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Um, my name is, uh, was MC to introduce uh, Emery Beck. I'm a location data analyst at Toy Tweets of Fenoil Land Information New Zealand, and I've had the, the utmost privilege of being able to work on the National Elevation Program for the past, past few years. Uh, my main role has been quality checking and publishing LiDAR-derived elevation data for most of New Zealand, uh, and I've tutored and had to play with the data enough uh, that I've managed to build up a, my own personal brand, Map Hustle, um, as well as a portfolio of, of a bunch of different works that um, I've spent, yeah, maybe three or so years just, just slowly building on. Um, today, my talk is titled Digital Earth Models, and that's a play on digital elevation models, which is one of the, 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 the products that we offer, um, derived products from LIDAR that, that you can download and interact with. Um, and uh, it's a play, on, yeah, being a play on the digital elevation model in the sense that I'm literally making models of our Earth in digital form. That's kind of uh, where I'm going with it. And for most of my visualizations, I'm after a particular style, and that style is akin to model train sets, model dioramas, um, and it's a style that I'd like to sh not only show with you, share with you, but also kind of go through how to make. Um, so to give you a rough structure of what this presentation will cover, I'll walk through with you to some degree how to produce these visuals and with the key learnings and challenges faced. Um, I'll show you the world of open source data, where you can get this data, the open source tools that I use, so that you all can hopefully are encouraged to, to start playing with yourself. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, and then also, uh, you, hopefully at the end of it, you'll come away with a high level understanding of, of what you uh, can do with this data, what can be done with this data in a more artistic manner. Um, so yeah, uh, without further ado, I guess we'll kick it off. So the brand itself is uh, a combination of two words, map and hustle. We all know what maps are, so I'll start with the hustle portion for those who don't know. And if you were to Google search it, it's urban slang for um, a state of great activity to strive headstrong and voraciously towards a goal. And putting the two words together, and what it means for me is a determined effort to do something through uh, a meaningful through producing maps and data viz. Uh, but not only that, it's also important to showcase what can be done and, and present the use of open source tools and data. Um, and for now, in the context of this presentation, I'd like to focus on um, a particular style, and that is digital dioramas, just simply because I, I think they look cool. So at the tip, as, as is typical and customary at the onset of any GIS application or project, one must hunt for and acquire some data. Um, and simply put, this style of visualization would not be possible without the high level of detail that this data set offers. Um, you can grab a lot of data from Lynn's data service, so that is the digital surface models, the digital elevation models that we're working with, um, but also a bunch of other data sources, so aerial imagery, bathymetry, topographic map data, a lot more, and it's sort of my one-stop shop for a lot of the mapping that I do. For the point clouds, I download these from Open Topography. Um, and as well as the point cloud download, they have a bunch of resources, YouTube videos, tutorials, blog posts, that sort of stuff on getting you started using the data. So I highly encourage you to check that out as well. And typically, um, I will start with the point cloud to produce something like this. I try and get uh, as high a resolution digital surface model as possible. And you can only really do that if you start working with the point clouds directly. Um, and the last is another resources section that I'll, I'll cover towards the end just to give you all a bit more information of where you can go with this. Um, so you, we hypothetically have some data. Now you need some tools. And this is all the t a list of all the tools that I use. It's all open source. Um, all of Matt Puzzle's visualizations have been produced using these tools and they're all yeah, and open source, which is, yeah, as I said before, really important. So a quick run through PDAL, GDAL, LAS tools is what I you, uh, and cloud compare is what I use to, to manipulate the point cloud and create grids, so surface models and elevation models. I use QGIS for anything and everything spatial. We all know what QGIS is. Uh, if I want to get fancy and start doing 3D stuff, I'll use Blender or Arial OD. Uh, both are kind of 3D modeling softwares. Um, and I'll, then I'll use GIMP. Uh, GIMP and Inkscape are kind of the, the Photoshop and the Illustrator equivalent of the open source world, so I'll use them for imagery editing and for adding text work after the fact if, um, if I need to. And at a very high level, uh, this workflow is what I employ to create visualizations like what you see on screen and what you will see throughout. Uh, so download the point cloud from Open Topography. They make it really easy for you to, to grab points. Uh, in most cases, I just draw a rectangle around the extent that I want 
and click download. And with your download, they also offer a Poetry Viewer, which is an online web browser uh, that you can view your point cloud before you start doing stuff. So really useful for, for, for knowing what needs to be edited and changed with the points. So then moving on to the second step, um, I'll clean the point cloud using PDAL. Often it's just a single simple pipeline uh, that uh, also, whilst it cleans the point cloud, and what I mean by that is removing extraneous classification value, uh, yeah, numbers, um, I might want to reclassify the ground to some degree. A bunch of stuff happens there. Uh, and then within this pipeline, I then grid the point cloud up into digital surface models typically. And um, <clears throat> I guess the point of difference is here, here is that I want to go for as low, sorry, as high a resolution as possible with the grids. Uh, 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter pixel size or lower. It just depends on what the data, uh, what, what, how dense the point cloud is and what the data looks like. So once I've created the grids, um, I'll pull, sorry, the grid, I'll pull that into QGIS. I'll create a bunch of different relief shade rasters, different layers, um, and I'll blend those together in a certain way that they look nice. And then still in QGIS, I'll overlay that with aerial imagery, blend that with the mash of relief shade layers that I've created, and if hopefully I'll have a cohesive scene. I'll then make refinements in GIMP, add text and Inkscape, um, I'm happy to stop at QGIS. I don't have to pull things into Blender if I don't want to. You can get great results in QGIS just as is. Um, but if I want to get fancy, as I said before, I'll pull things into a 3D modeling software. And that's where the, the real mo model diorama-esque style kind of takes shape. Um, because <laughs> I, I realize that Blender is a bit of an unwieldy beast and a lot of people don't simply have the time to kind of tackle it. Um, the next portion of the presentation, I'd just like to go through making a visual of Wellington City just from scratch, and if you are only within QGIS. So, uh, yeah, you can get great results just in QGIS. So hopefully that's encouraging. And the relief shading and certain techniques that I, that I use are where the digital diorama style begins to form. So it's like with, with model diorama creation, you start with the textural component, the base layer, the hill shade that you build contextual information on top, and in that case, it's the aerial imagery. And, and I guess the more astute amongst you, the ones who've worked with this sort of data before, will likely know what each of the, the rasters are, especially that one. Um, but what I'll do is I'll layer them in a certain way, tweak the symbology, tweak the blending mode, change the colors, contrast, etc., cetera, um, so that features that stack up on top of each other don't get blotted out by features beneath each other. And it's, it's a bit of a... It's a bit of an art more than, than a science, I suppose, and a good context that I can provide for that is uh, when you create a digital surface model and you create a hill shade on that surface model, you're dealing with a lot of complex features. So vegetation specifically tends to have a lot of occluded light and become quite dark. And when you overlay aerial imagery on top, um, you, you tend to get more black, well, dark grayish green vegetation that looks unlike the real life. And so I can create a raster that specifically targets that aspect of um, the overall scene I'm trying to create so I can enhance the vegetation, brighten it up so it looks more true to, to what the imagery is. And that's that's the science and, and I guess yeah, the magic with that. So when you combine all the hill shades and the rasters together, um, you end up with a scene that can look something like this. And just bear in mind, this is a 25 centimeter by 25 centimeter grid, so it's a very high resolution product. Um, but yeah, like with model dioramas, we we still struggle a little bit to distinguish between vegetation from buildings and that sort of stuff. So that's where the contextual information overlay really, really helps. So building on this, uh, the finished scene in QGIS alone can end up looking something like this. I used a blend, uh, sorry, a multiply blending mode on the aerial imagery, um, changed the brightness, contrast, and saturation to match the actual aerial image that was captured. Bit of guesswork here. Um, but another thing to point out is it's important to use data that was captured within the same temporal window, so all within 2021. Obviously, uh, features that are present in the imagery captured at a different date might not be present in the LiDAR. And so you end up with these weird artifacts that just pop up and, and make the scene just look a bit silly. So that is one thing to note. And then another thing to note, and I don't know if it's clear. Oh, yeah, it is. Um, I don't know if the pointy. 
Uh, if you look at the, the bell tower or the big building, or maybe actually the, the cir oval circular sorry, structure, the shadows go from go to the southeast. And at the very top of the, the image, you can see shadows going to the southwest. And this is probably one of the biggest headaches with um, creating these scenes is, is actually just dealing with shadows and how to handle it. Um, so you can pull the image into GIMP or, or Photoshop or something and remove the shadows that way in a, in a fun artistic way. Or you can use one of QGIS's many, terrain sh uh, many plugins, in this case the terrain shading plugin that has a shadow depth uh, tool you can run. Um, and I'm hoping that no one can see or no one will see the shadows at the top deviate from the fake big shadows that I've now uh, put on the scene. And it's quite subtle, so I apologize if you can't see it, um, but this is also just an example of the kind of subtlety that, that I'm working with on a day-to-day on -day whenever creating those scenes. So there we go. And uh, similar to, to, to Blender being an unwieldy beast, I understand that out there amongst you, you may not want to create your own uh, grids from point clouds. It might be a step a bit too beyond what you're willing to go, and that's totally fine. Um, this is just to prove that you can get the same uh, output in the sense of, of, of you know, model diorama-esque style just using the one meter products if you were to download them from the Linz data service. Um, <clears throat> however, I'd like to point out also that uh, different design style are kind of put into this visualization and it's really important to do that sort of thing, especially when we're getting uh, aerial imagery data sets that are going down to like 10 centimeter resolutions. It becomes a bit hard to, to create scenes because the imagery is just so good. Um, if I was to create the scene with the intention um, to just produce something as realistic as possible, I'd likely get passed over as a photo, just an image. So it's not until you introduce something that's slightly uncanny, slightly off, um, you know, with this maybe it's a bit too green and brown, the vegetation looks a bit weird, the pixelated artifacts in the river and the different colors of the two rivers. I don't know, there's something about it that uh, takes away from the realism. Um, but it's that aspect, you want to create something that's more memorable at the expense of realism is when people start to double take and look at your visualizations and, and begin to ponder. Um, and I'll call this the uncanniness factor and I'll reiterate this a, a couple of couple more times as we go along. So with simple techniques of just, well, simple techniques, learned techniques of just mashing a bunch of layers together to create a cohesive scene, you can end up with, with, with cool looking products like this just in QGIS. Now moving away from, from Q and going into uh, the more 3D side of thing, Blender, um, you end up creating the scene that Matt Hustle was sort of trying to go for, and that is, uh, again, model dioramas. So for those that don't know, Blender's a 3D modeling software. It utilizes a built-in ray tracing engine to produce very realistic looking scenes in terms of lighting and surfaces you can create. Um, and and it's, it's really the perfect medium for, for, for what I want to do. The left image shows just the digital surface model rendered in Blender, and output is an image. It looks kind of like snow. Uh, there's a lot less detail in it than, than what we've just created in QGIS, which is that scene on the right-hand side. And, and it's the same thing in Blender that we're doing, and I'll reiterate over many more times, is we're draping uh, the contextual over the textural. Um, you can't, uh, sorry, in QGIS, uh, you, there's no realistic lighting, which is what we gain from using Blender. Um, and in Blender, we're missing the, all the detail that we've extracted from QGIS, and that's what we're adding back to Blender. And then uh, outputting a scene, you end up with something that looks like this. And just note, I've exaggerated the shadows just to kind of prove the point of, of difference between QGIS and Blender. But um, you can very readily see that it looks like light is being cast across the model. It looks tactile. Um, and, and, and yeah, this is, this is what I want to, I guess, finish creating uh, in Blender to some degree. Oh, not quite. Ultimately, making a map out of it is actually really where you want to go. Um, because the data is spatial by nature and design, converting it into a map, adding those typical map elements that we see, you know, scale bar, north arrow, inset map, et cetera, um, helps reinforce the viewer uh, that what you've created is a representation of the real world, is using real world data, um, and everything is to scale. A lot <laughs> I found a lot of dads are really interested in the real world, real data to scale stuff when you show them things like this. So um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great combination between science and art, which um, I, yeah, I, I love. Um, so yeah, that is the finished product that I want to achieve with, with, with Matt Hustle.
product. So the first two sections covered the 2D, but what's intrinsic to LiDAR is its ability to visualize in 3D. It is 3D data, it has an X, Y, and a Z component, um, and, and reiterating over the fact that abstract visuals typically garner the most interest from folks because it leaves a lot up to the imagination. So the last lot of visuals I'll cover will be in this, in this 3D space. Um, and to start with, the, the data is incredibly detailed. I cannot stress this enough. The data is fantastic. It's awesome. Um, a visual of Mount Taranaki, so this was output using Aerial OD, uh, and it's just here to show you why you should be using the data. It's incredibly detailed. You can see individual rock boulders and stuff on scree slopes, lava flows, etc. cetera. Um, and yeah. Uh, If you look at it for a few more seconds, then we'll move on. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, some key learnings I've found when visualizing the DEMs and the DSMs in 3D, and, and this is stuff that's really important to know up front, especially when you're starting to use the data. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've just scratched my head over stuff that um, I wish I knew right off the get-go because I would save myself hours and hours. So here's hopefully some of that for, for anyone who's, who's intrepid to, who wants to actually start playing with this data. So the DEMs themselves are usually fine, relatively problematic, problem-free when mapping in 3D. Um, and that's because they're typically less busy than the DSMs. It's easy to overlay information on top of them, topographic maps, aerial imagery, and, and the like. Um, you know, applications where knowing the general lie of the land are more important, the DEMs are very are useful for. And, and as you can see in that, that uh, along that scoria cone volcano, a track beneath vegetation, which you can't see in the DSM, applications where knowing where tracks are, um, you know, is important, you'll, you'll want to use the DEM, and you can readily map the DEM in 3D for, for most purposes. The DSM, however, um, is a little different. And it's fine when you map in the grayscale like this, but when you start mixing in color and aerial imagery and draping, doing the same things that I was talking about earlier, uh, you end up with a, with, with a few problems. And one of those problems, for example, uh, is the sides of buildings look quite jagged because we're dealing with rasters, we're not dealing with vectors, it's pixels. Um, and also there's a bit of a draping issue from aerial imagery going down the sides of the buildings you can see. I don't have a solution for this, so I probably need to and play a bit more of the data, but um, there are techniques that you can do to hopefully mitigate these. And one of them is a thing from photographic, uh, yeah, photography is tilt shift miniaturization. Fancy word for just adding a focus blur on an image. Um, so I'm hiding the artifacts with that focus blur whilst drawing your attention to what I want you to focus on. And hopefully that provides enough of a, a, an uncanny scene that you don't care about the off things. So um, that's as far as I've got with visualizing the DSMs in 3D. Um, yeah. <laughs> but then scale, conversely, is, is to your favor. Just zooming out several hundreds of meters um, in your environment, you'll, you'll completely avoid those artifacts. You don't even see them because you, you can't see that close up on, on the model. And, and again, touching back on that uncanniness factor and keeping with the digital diorama theme, um, adding elements like tables, chairs, it's not hard to see. Um, you could walk into a room and find a bunch of different tables and chairs and set up with a whole bunch of different maps all around a virtual room. So um, something just to keep in mind. And if you want to visualize the data, you're not interested in doing Blender stuff, I highly encourage you to check out Aerial OD. Rather than fluff around, pre-process data, put it in a certain format, load it into Blender and go back and forth trying to get it to work, you can quite simply click and drag a digital surface model into the map window of Aerial OD and begin mapping. And you end up with results that, in my opinion, look far better than Blender at the cost of half the time. So um, if you haven't and don't know about Aerial OD, I highly encourage you to check it out. <coughs> um, a bit of a plug for maphustle.co.nz, which is my portfolio and website. We have a blog post on importing and visualizing point cloud data in Blender. It's a multi-step process and a little bit tricky, um, but if you want to know any more on how to do that, I highly encourage you to check out that. 
And then on elevationaotearoa.co.nz, we also have a, a how-to guide on colorizing point cloud with RGB values from aerial imagery. Um, and throwing, you can then conversely put that into Blender, uh, which uh, you end up avoiding a lot of those sides of features, surface model problems if you just directly use the point cloud, and they also look really cool. So um, I almost only use the, the point cloud to map in, in the 3D now. And then the last little visual, um, going to opentopography.org, uh, they have a step-by-step -step YouTube video on how to create and export 3D print files that you can send straight to a 3D printers and have a 3D printed model sitting on your coffee table by the weekend. Um, I yeah, really recommend you do that. We've got some 3D models on the lens table. Go check them out during the breaks. And then to finally leave you with the take home, uh, data from lens data service, from open topography, Elevation Aotearoa is the primary place we direct people for additional resources. You go to the front page, it has a release schedule with a bunch of different, uh, t sorry, a bunch of different tabs. The front page is a release schedule letting you know where the LiDAR data is available, what's up and coming. And then this last tab is a bunch of visualizations made by the, the team at Elevation team at Linz, Abby, Luca, myself. Um, so if your visual itch hasn't been scratched, please uh, visit the site and check the rest of what the team at Linz does. Thank you very much. Okay, we've probably got time for just one question, I think. So raise your hand and hopefully you'll be the lucky one. All good. We don't have any questions. Oh, yes, we do, down the front. Uh, yeah, so in, uh, hang, hang Blender, on, just wait for the microphone. Uh, in Blender, the uh, scene of the Basin Reserve there, uh, which should sort of set out that diorama um, kind of view with realistic lighting. Yep. Um, have you thought about uh, sort of animating that light uh, within Blender and exporting an animation? That'd look pretty cool. I haven't, that's a good idea. Um, to be honest, I, <laughs> I find playing with Blender a bit of a beast in itself. <laughs> Getting yep. to that animation stage, yeah, I, I haven't even thought of it at the moment, but um, yeah, get, Getting to a point where you, you, you end up doing something like a fly through of a scene and, and moving a camera around, like say all of Wellington or all of Auckland or something, would be, would be really nice. It would be a really interactive way to show people what, what, what the data looks like. Um, I haven't got there yet, but I'll, I'll have to think about it now that you've... <laughs> Blender's a, a huge but powerful thing, eh? <laughs> it, is. <laughs> it is, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, thanks, Emery. That was an awesome presentation. Let's have a round of applause.